Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the latest in the NASCOM Future of Work series. Today's theme is on employee well-being at the workplace. And although this theme is something not new, and technology companies have always focused on the well-being of their employees, it is positioned more as a employee retention and engagement anchor. What we'll attempt to do today is going to be something different. We'll try and see how this entire team is evolving, especially given our experience uh, of the pandemic and what has been happening since then. So some of the themes that we'll try and explore and understand from the experts today is how is the employee will be becoming more intentional and purposeful, uh, something that is a must-have rather than a good-to-have. Uh, we'll also try and understand the role of the top management in building wellness as an organizational culture and the role that HR is playing in making this a reality. We'll also look at wellness from different aspects, uh, physical, mental, financial, digital, and social. But first, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. All of, will, all of you will be on mute for the duration of this webinar. Uh, you can put up your questions anytime during the webinar in the Q&A panel. If you wish to direct any question to a particular panelist, please mention their names. And we'll have a 10 to 15 minutes audience Q&A session towards the end. A recording of this webinar will also be made available on the NASCOM YouTube channel. I will uh, mail all of you the link. With that, I would now like to introduce the panelists. Uh, our first panelist today is Tendril Maran. She's Director HR at NatWest Digital Services India Private Limited. Her experience as an HR professional is drawn from her 18 years of cumulative experience across multiple domains in HR, such as business partnering, partnering diversity and inclusion, performance, rewards and benefits, employee relations, talent and change management, transformation, and HR operations. In her current role with NatWest Group, Tendril is responsible for driving strategic people priorities that influence business outcomes. She also holds cross-geographical experience, having worked internationally with senior stakeholders and teams in India, UK, Europe, and Asia, largely in the financial services sector. She carries a strong passion for people, helping organizations and communities thrive. Welcome, Tendra. Our next guest is Sachin Kurana, Chief People Officer and Senior, Senior Vice President, People Practice at Happiest Minds. A human resources leader with over 16 years of experience in IT, ITES, infrastructure, and real estate. Sachin has a proven track record of leading and transforming HR functions to support business growth and success. He has expertise in all aspects of HR, including talent acquisition and development, employee relations, compensation and benefits, and organizational design. He's passionate about creating workplaces that are inclusive, diverse, and equitable, building great employee experiences. Great to have you with us, Sachin. Thank you, Diksha. Uh, from Datamatics Business Solutions, uh, delighted to uh, welcome Lolly Vadaseri, uh, CHRO. Apart from being the CHRO, she is also responsible for business excellence and compliance functions. Her experience of close to 26 years in HR spans strategic HR, culture transformation, organization development, organization design, leadership coaching, and development. A commerce graduate, she has also done her MSc in psychotherapy and counseling from the Institute of Psychotherapy and Management Services. She is also an ICF accredited ACC coach and an NLP practitioner. She was featured on the cover story of CIO Views in November 2022 as one of the top 10 most in influential HR executives to watch out for in 2022 and also in the World Leaders Magazine as one of the visionary leaders in tech in May 2023. Welcome, Lolly. Thank you, Diksha. And finally, from Mastech, Arvind Jay, who is the global CHRO. He is responsible for the 
groups global hr strategy people experience and development organizational culture and employee experience advin has nearly 3 decades of global experience in transformational hr leadership digitization mergers and acquisitions leadership development organizational culture building and designing effective employee experiences his success spans the gamut of publicly traded and private equity backed professional services companies setting up entities in new geographies across india apac middle east and the us he has held high business impact leadership roles at dmi cms it services cisco systems wipro technologies and rampo systems a very warm welcome to all the panelists and thank you for taking a time to be here uh, okay. i wanted to start this conversation uh, first with understanding you know if we uh, think of the timelines as pre pandemic and post pandemic uh, how has your outlook towards employee well being changed given the experience we have seen in the pandemic and uh, in what direction has it pushed your wellness programs uh, i want to start with trendil first please thank you thank you diksha for first of all to having me in the panel today along with the other panelists it's 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 lovely to be here to discuss this important topic it's ever important as you say to come back to your particular question how has the pandemic shifted absolutely it's been a paradigm shift in terms of how well being as a topic um has completely changed not just for my organization all of us even from a personal as well as professional both in india as well as globally as such um you know the what pandemic has definitely taught us is absolutely put a big underlined importance to how each one of us uh, in our own capacity have seen well being to be it's actually pushed us in terms of you know setting aside time to really look at well-being as a holistic approach now coming back into my organization where i represent from a nappa standpoint it is definitely taken a big 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 seat into our people strategy and it is definitely part of it's an integral part of our people strategy uh we do have people pledges uh, which is globally driven and i must say that it supporting colleagues well-being is is certainly a big focus we already had the focus but i must say that what we learned through the pandemic has helped us to dial up our efforts in terms of building well being as a as a as a core proposition it's no more a nice to have uh when we actually go back in the market to attract talent well being has become a part of a total employee value proposition people started to look at what we offering and we also see those uh, behavior shift in the market and therefore even within us actually we look at it more more holistic as such uh the well being strategy that we follow is called live well being you it's definitely holistic in terms of focusing on four key pillars uh, some of it that you called out picture at the beginning which is definitely on physical well being mental well uh, social well being and financial well being <clears throat> as such and of course under each of these pillars we do have a bouquet of services because from a well being standpoint it's very very difficult to say one size fits all and therefore we have a bouquet of services under each of it um and how do we drive in terms of how the shift has dialed up it's just not about having you know service offering we also have the senior leader sponsorship in terms of um you know just to give you an example we do have one of our manco members lead out to be the sponsor and we have a very good network of wellbeing champions who really look at wellbeing as a very good passion in terms of how do they dialed up uh implementation of lot of initiatives that we do back into the nth level of our organization as such so well being champions absolutely play an integral part in terms of taking some of the initiatives we don't force people to really do and participate in everything but we give them options to choose the flexibility to choose what really works for them so that's that's in a very very high level that i would want to see how it's shifted for us um and i think it is it is definitely one of our key employee value proposition that some of our future potential uh, talents definitely look and very interested to to see what we offer thank you tendril uh, sachin oh yeah i think uh, uh, tendril really said the 
uh, tone in terms of you know the change that we are uh, seeing pre and post COVID. To give a context of the organization at Happiest Mind, you know we were we all wellness was a very important part of our people strategy and charter from a beginning of the organization. And you know that comes from our name itself, you know Happiest Mind vision of happiest people, happiest customers, a lot of focus on people, well-being, physical, mental, financial. Now, what shift that happened during COVID and post-COVID was that uh, the people, as you know, Thandra was saying, people started giving that priority to their well-being much, much higher. So the participation from those initiatives that we're doing people's curiosity, asking for more, asking for what's relevant for them, what they are seeking for themselves and their families, you know, how they got their families involved, how they got their kids involved, their parents involved. I think that drastically changed. And actually what that did was up the enthusiasm of our team who were investing their times and energies into the whole wellness charter. So that it gave them the you know, the motivation that, you know, they're doing something and now there is a larger audience which are, uh, you know, getting value from them. And the second change, I would say, is that, you know, uh, uh, while the initiatives were great and I think it helped accelerate uh, some of the programs, but, you know, the conversation of well-being in the board, you know, uh, has increased drastically. There was, you know, conversation, hey, you know, what we are doing for the organization, the ask, the sponsorship, the participation, uh, uh, it became a board conversation. It became a leadership conversation, which was not necessarily uh, the part. And the third thing um, that really that transformed from us was how the leadership got engaged into the initiative. And you know, while there was sponsorship, but how my leaders are coming and participating in those initiatives for themselves, you know, encouraging the members to, you know, make the most of those initiatives that has been curated for our members. You know, I think that was, I would say, a few beautiful outcomes from that very difficult time, right? People started value their health and people started valuing their time differently. And I think this has only uh, helped mature our uh, programs, you know, while we were doing in a certain manner with the impact that we were able to drive, we were able to see that this well-being has a direct relation to the engagement of people in the organization. It has direct relation to the productivity of the organization. Our members were our brand ambassadors and they became a champion for the work uh, we were doing. They themselves came in to say, you know, we want to collaborate. We have someone who want to who can do some initiative, who want, how can I be part of our happy zest, which is our wellness charter. You know, I want to be a volunteer. I want to be participant because I see what is the value that you're creating for people because I made the use of it. Can I become a part of it so that I can also support our members through the larger programs that we have? So um, I think it became part of us. These days, people are not calling out, oh, there's a wellness initiative happening as a separate initiative we say oh this has to happen as part of our daily chart i think there should be something that the organization should do that i should do we are having a run on 17th uh happiest mind run this is having after the covid the first time you know coming back after a back in a gap of four years we are expecting some 1200 to 1500 happiest minds and some of the external folks joining in for that run now, we're talking about 20% of your population participating. I think that's the enthusiasm it has created. Uh, that's a little bit of my side from how the transition I see on the wellness. Touching one question is, uh, you mentioned employees themselves becoming more interested in well-being programs, maintaining their health. Do you see that also containing now since the fear of the pandemic is practically gone? and life is getting back to normal, even if it's in a hybrid mode. Uh, do you see that, or is it sort of? Yeah, so, it, you know, just see this, maybe the example. If we were having a webinar session on well-being, we, should, we would be easily getting hundreds of participation in that. These is that participation is not there. And I think given that, you know, 
uh, people's other priorities which were on back burner uh, came back. Um, wellness has taken definitely, uh, you know, it has come few notches from their priority list. But I think it has also become their part of their being. You know, for them, it was a shock and they wanted to, they were overdoing also. So I think they're not overdoing anymore. So if there is a need, they will go. I think we still have programs which has great participation on a well-being. These days, what is relevant? I think uh, financial well-being suddenly is something that people are very, very uh, uh, curious and want to know more. And I think, you know, something which is relevant, there are still pockets which are very, very relevant. People are doing what is meaningful, but earlier people are doing overdoing and that overdoing is definitely not there. <laughs> Yeah, understandable. Lolly, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Diksha, for having me here. Um, you know, um, pre-COVID, COVID and post-COVID, if one were to look at that uh, time period, um, I think the COVID phase was one phase where uh, I recall, I mean, Datamatics is an organization. Uh, we actually shifted to a complete work from home even before, well, before the Prime Minister announced a complete national lockdown, right? And the only driving factor at that point of time was we do not want our people to be putting themselves at risk by traveling all the way from uh, Berar and, you know, uh, Dombivili and all these far off places. So for us, it was always a predominant that we put people first. And I think that people first culture was there even much before COVID started. And that continues. So we firmly believe that you take care of your people and people take care of the business and the clients. And um, this, in a way, sort of uh, got exemplified even during the COVID time, where uh, we made sure that, you know, first thing was to safeguard the people's, uh, you know, uh, lives in terms of making sure that they do not have to travel, they do not have to uh, travel long distances and come. Having said that, I think during COVID, there were a whole lot of initiatives. We engaged actually two wellness um, coaches, if I should say who were engaged with us. In fact, one of these wellness coaches was actually also more of a spiritual coach. This was a time when I think people were facing all kinds of anxiety, dealing with loss, um, you know, um, some of them grieving the loss of their uh, near and dear ones. And somebody or the other was always impacted, right? And I think this initiative, so we launched this as a We Care initiative, and that received tremendous response. It was open to employees and, and their families, okay? And we actually had people calling in and uh, responding very, very favorably to say that this was a much needed respite, in addition to all the other things which were there. Um, Post-COVID, I think uh, the, the requirement of a, a wellness coach, I mean, having two coaches on board didn't make sense for us because the, the, obviously it came down, right? All the stress and the anxiety and the angst of COVID getting over, that did come down. But we did see that you know, there is a constant need, of course. I would not say that um, uh, post-COVID, that anxiety levels, while it has come down, but there are probably different levels of anxiety. Like I think Sachin and Tendril already uh, shared. I think people are also more aware of what is it that they are looking for. People have become a lot more, um, uh, if I should say, not just aware of what they want, but also aware of how it is impacting them. Uh, so, for example, we still work in a hybrid model, right? And this has worked beautifully for people. So, we have put the essence of making sure that as long as it works for everyone, right? It works for the people, it will actually work for the business too. So, I think that has been the predominant uh, feature, so to speak, that we make sure that people interests are taken care of. And to that extent, I think post-COVID and, you know, now that we look at we are trying to see that the well-being aspect, and I think like you covered, whether it is um, uh, physical, emotional, mental, you know, the uh, financial well-being and all of that, these are all aspects. And in each of these areas, we've got initiatives covered, which have helped people to really take care of some of these various aspects. Great. Thank you, Lani. Yeah, Arvind. Thanks, thanks, Lolly. That is a good, uh, you know, way to. I mean, it's always challenging to talk the last, you know, but I'll try to, you know, give some color to it. So yeah, I think uh, pre-pandemic, by and large, most firms did what they did. Right? It was more, you know, uh, reaction to what was happening. You really didn't control the uh, script. We all, I mean, nobody had seen pandemic, right? Uh, after the Spanish flu, I mean, we were not, no more, we were not born that time, right? So it is a lifetime experience, and that's something we'll tell our grandchildren eventually. 
So I think by and large, at that point, we we're all scattering and did the right things. Uh, but the question about uh, what's happening today, uh, I still believe the blur between the professional and personal life is still, you know, getting thinner. I mean, that's the biggest challenge I see when we talk to employees because uh, while we do hybrid, remote, the challenge is, you know, I'll talk about the context of India initially, where our infrastructure is not very set up to really work from home. If you look at it, most of us don't live in homes and we not, don't have an office uh, kind of a setup. Maybe some of us at this level may have it, but typically if you look at the young programmers who live in PGs and, you know, who live in hostels, don't really have a setup. So if you look at it, uh, the work from home or work from wherever and remote hybrid uh, has become so challenging that people are not able to draw a line. When do I stop and when do I start? So that I think is one of the aftermaths of, you know, uh, the pandemic, which I think we are still trying to manage. Uh, but as my colleagues rightly, the panelists said, right, most things are the right things we're doing from wellness. But I personally believe this is one area where I think uh, we are trying to do a lot of work, you know, and uh, I mean, I'm, a, I'm fairly new to Mastic. I joined around, you know, two months back, but I'm amazed with the culture that's been here. What what we all talk about and read about, you know, it's been very much been done for the last 40 decades in this company. So if, I mean, if you get some time, you should read something called as Mastic 4.0. Uh, some of the things we are talking now has been done like 10, 15 years in Mastic. That's something unique. I have experienced as a new employee. So well-being has always been, you know, a part of the DNA of Mastic. But I think post the pandemic, as I said, one, definitely we are trying to do things where we are trying to give people some time off from themselves rather than being on treadmill, right? Uh, and, you know, and uh, like the standard, you know, things we do on financial, psychological, social aspects, etc. cetera. Uh, the key thing what uh, we are trying to do is to have a, systemic way of letting people get their own time so that, you know, uh, they are off the, you know, uh, device or off the, you know, uh, digital detox, as we call it, etc. So that is one area I feel uh, people need help. Um, second, as, you know, Sachin was alluding to, right, people have now understood what they need, but well-being has become very integral to people's life. I think people have, have understood it, right, because nowadays you don't need to get old to die. You see a lot of young people, you know, collapsing. So people are generally, you know, I think maybe it's also a question of, the maturity of the economy, right? You know, India is still evolving. They're still a developing country, but if you look at Europe and US, well-being is very integral. The work is incidental for them. Uh, you know, work is just to pay the bills. Whereas in India, it's a different. We are still in a stage of evolution. So in that sense, you know, uh, we are trying to help employees to you know understand what it means to you know be both on these four pillars. What I just spoke about, right? You know, social, you know, uh, spiritual, emotional, and financial. Uh, but financial also is equally important because I think, uh, especially the from a gender perspective, I talk about it culturally. You know, the women folk don't really spend or invest time on the financial aspects of it. It's given that somebody in the home takes care. So we are also trying to do specific programs where we are trying to build some financial acumen so that you know how to plan, how to save, you know, how to understand the financial aspects. So in in case of a calamity, you are able to manage it. So as I said, it's an evolution. We're all learning. You know, I think nobody knows the right answer, but. I think it's all about how do you help people understand, you know, uh, their space and try to, you know, because I think this work from home is going to continue. I don't think it's going to stop because that's becoming a talent attraction challenge also. Now that we went to one end of the spectrum where we hired people across and we asked people to come back to a location, you know, we can't do it, you know, abruptly. So as we do this entire thing, uh, the last element before I sign off on this is we're also trying to engage and train our managers better on how do they manage this kind of a workforce because that is the place where the rubber meets the road, right? You know, while we can talk a lot of good things, the leadership does mean the right thing. How well do the managers understand how to engage? And, you know, um, you can't be like chasing people, tracking them on their team chat, et cetera, right? So a lot of small things, but, you know, that's how you put a lot of stress on the employees. So we're also trying to do a lot of intervention at the middle and the next level managers and try to, you know, enable them to work in this new norm, which is, how do you trust people more when they're not in front of you, right? How do you, you know, build those relationships where you're able to have non-transactional conversations and build their long-lasting relationships? Thank you, Arvind. I think there are some points where I, I do want to uh, know more, so I'll come to those questions. But what I heard from all of you is that wellness for almost all companies is now a core value proposition. So from a corporate perspective, it is seen as a value proposition. On the other side of it, employees continue to prioritize their health, right? Uh, much more than maybe earlier, given uh, our experience with, you know, so much uh, 
grief during the pandemic. Uh, leaders are being seen as well-being champions and they're driving it from the top. Um, uh, and that is, of course, because of that, there's leadership sponsorship and increased leadership engagement also in these programs. And But what is also happening is that wellness priorities probably have shifted. Now that the fear of pandemic is not there, uh, probably it's, I mean, maybe the priorities would have changed to something beyond physical and mental wellness. That's what I heard um, all of you guys say. Uh, normally, when we talk about HR, HR tech plays a big role, right? Even HR is seen leveraging technology. Uh, we've heard of sentiment analysis. We've heard of AI being leveraged for uh, talent acquisition. It is being used for uh, L&D, charting career maps, charting learning roadmaps, etc. From a well-being perspective, do you see technology playing? What kind of a role is technology? I'm curious about that. Arvind, since we you ended last, I'll start with you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think I shouldn't have said that, but yeah, but yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, uh, technology works both ways. You know, I think to start with, I think we're also trying to do a detox of technology. You know, I think we are overdone the technology because of the remoteness of the uh, workforce. Uh, but yeah, I, mean, I think uh, given that the entire workforce composition has become hybrid and remote, uh, technology plays a very central role because that's the way you engage, you know, and build the employee experience, what we talk about. Uh, the challenge has been, you know, some of the employees you know, aren't being hired in remote local, whatever locations, getting them to even meet us, you know, uh, frequently is a challenge. So so, the, so it's key that one, we use tech very effectively. And as a company, we are fairly invested. You now we are tech companies, obviously, you know, we have to walk the talk. So if you look at it, I'll not name the products, but we are fairly, you know, I mean, if you can talk about the top products, I think we are kind of have them, you know, on house. And um, they've been fairly well leveraged for three, I, mean, I would say for a couple of things. One is, you know, uh, from a well-being perspective itself, right? We have tied up with a couple of firms where, you know, we have got certain apps which we work and employees have access to it. And we have kind of integrated our EAP program into the app. So people do have, you know, uh, and it's also an anonymous kind of an EAP. So people, if they have any stressful, con you know, issues or something, they want to get an external counseling, they can use the app to, you know, reach out to somebody. And that is all an anonymous, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, set of what we have. So we, nobody really gets to know what they talked about when we don't want to know also. So that is one thing, you know, we have an app in which people have access and that's been fairly well utilized, I would say, from a consumption and adoption. That's something definitely we see it, it being used. Uh, apart from that, as I said, we have a tie with the global firm for all our EAP activities, which is fairly on a, a very robust technology platform because this is not acquired only for India. We're talking about Europe and U.S. That's where most of our workforce is, right? So we need to, so we ensure that, you know, people are, you know, using that app to, you know, uh, manage their wellness initiatives. And the, the beauty about technology is it's fairly self-empowering. It's like when, if you remember, as I think uh, Sachin really called it out, right? We overdid the entire thing of getting webinars, et cetera. But today people can do it at their own pace, right? I mean, people are fairly matured, you know, adults and, you know, not, uh, and intelligent people, right? So... The app kind of gives you, the technology gives you the space to operate at your own pace so that we don't really enforce things on them. But there's a host of, you know, uh, information, a host of, you know, uh, resources avail available for people uh, for them to really manage their, you know, uh, issues, which could be unique to themselves. So that is something, you know, we are really working on. Uh, and, you know, as I said initially also, we're also trying our best to do a lot of digital detox. How do we avoid technology also being too much into people's lives and world? Right. Uh, uh, and that note, for example, we have something like a, every month, you know, we have one day where we have no meeting day and we really we, no meeting day. There's, ah, there's okay. no meeting. Right. You know, so we, we and that's really followed well because I mean, believe me, the number of calls you're doing these days is, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, we all use AI and machine learning and all the good stuff. But if you really compute the number of hours we're spending, it's, it's crazy. So we do. And that has been take well accepted by people. And also, sometimes we get a little creative when recently the World Cup match happened and we lost, unfortunately, India lost, but we all knew nobody's going to work, right? It's fun. It's, we, we all know that. So we gave we gave away surprise one day before we gave an off to the employees. We said, you know, uh, it was on a Wednesday, right? We called it Mindful Wednesday and just declared it off. And I mean, I mean, wherever, unless people are in a customer situation or supporting something. So it, it is all well accepted. So I think it's all about, you know, uh, you know, clubbing technology and some creativity to give employees something back. So that you know they feel that they've been cared for 
Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what we are trying to do as an organization. So, and Lolly, any use cases that you you see? Yeah. So I think uh, when uh, when one talks about um, well in the well-being space and the use of uh, HR tech, if you look at it very simplistically, I mean, all of us are employees, just like the people that who we are looking at, right? Who we are. I think as HR, all of us sitting here, our responsibility is to see that employees have a spring in their step when they come to work on a Monday morning, whether in office or remotely, doesn't matter, right? So that's something which all of us here in HR uh, carry that. Uh, onus onto our shoulders. So having said that, I think uh, like uh, Arvind has rightly said, while technology does play a role in terms of making sure that, you know, there are enough and more tools and apps which one can uh, really utilize, uh, the, the reality is, the way I see it is, there's nothing which can replace the human connect, right? So the HR business partners who are connected to people will have a lot more insights coming their way when they engage with people rather than just an engagement survey or you know whether you, whether you talk about a, a sentiment analysis or any of these tools which should be there so we are definitely uh, uh, done uh, enough and more um, in that aspect to see that there is a very good connect with people number one number two the whole objective is to see that whatever that we get as part of these uh, you know insights from the um, apps or the tools, whatever that we are using, is to see how we can make sure that people are feeling that their well-being is ta being taken care of. So I think one of the key things which uh, as HR folks, I truly believe it's not just HR who owns the people, right? Owns the resources. It's the immediate manager. So how much do we make them uh, sensitized on how people need to be managed, how we need to sort of set the boundaries, how we need to, I mean, I love what Arvin talked about uh, you know, no, uh, in a month, a no meeting day. In fact, I'm of the view that why should there be even meetings if it's not required, right? Most of the meetings end up being long, uh, tedious discussions, which if the people who know what they have to do, you know, they can just do it. So I think the more we look at creating a climate of trust and empowerment, people definitely start giving wonderful results. You know, pre-COVID, pre when we used to do our engagement surveys, we were in the range of about 85 to 88 COVID and post-COVID, so I'm talking about, let's say, from uh, March of 2020 to now, when we have done the surveys, our surveys have shown that our engagement scores have gone up from 89 to 92%. So we are in that kind of a range. And I think a lot of that has been possible because of the conscious effort of making sure that every employee is feeling that sense of being included into the whole process. So whether it is you know, in terms of his or her ideas. So we have an idea portal, right? Where people can give up their, give their ideas. They are recognized for it. It could be the junior most person on the floor, but you know, he or she gets a recognition when it comes. And a whole lot of initiatives to really make sure that people feel that this is yet another hope for them. You know, we have actually had a whole, whole lot of people coming and telling us, you know, we don't want to work out of home. Can we just come to office and be there on all the days? Because we can be a lot more productive while we are in office. So how does one create that? This, You know, how do you create a safe space for people to really... We have actually conducted sessions for the middle-level managers uh, to sort of handle even sometimes issues which may come as a surprise to them. You know, suddenly you may have a team member who comes and shares things with you of you know, something you never anticipated, something that that person is, is weighing down on his or her mind. So how do they tackle some of these situations? How can they be constantly sensitive? You know, it's like, you know, the thing that, you know, people will always remember how you made them feel. They may not remember what you said or did, right? So all our leadership development programs are towards sensitizing them to become better people managers. Functionally, technical skills, they all have, right? So it's all about making sure. And I think those efforts are what really goes a long way in creating that space for employees and making them feel. We've got a lot of boomerang employees. You know, during the great resignation wave, we did have some resignations. I'll, I'll, I'll be foolish in, say, in not accepting that, yes, there were resignations. But the surprising part is we did have a lot of people coming back and saying, you know what, we miss the culture. We miss the fun we used to have here. So I think that sometimes goes a long way in making sure you have the human connect at all times, no matter what. So one, uh, there are a couple of questions I have related, uh, slightly uh, in the sense that whenever we talk about 
HR, it's all about people, the people management, uh, being empathetic. Uh, and when technology comes into the picture, there, there is fine lines between privacy and what is allowed, right? Uh, how are you guys managing that? Where I, I mean, uh, where are you sort of recognizing that this is a place that I shouldn't cross, even though I'm concerned about my employees? Any points around that on what care you're taking from privacy angle? That was one. And I think uh, also there was this interesting question, which since Lolly, uh, you mentioned, uh, you talked about rewards and recognition for you know people who uh, share their ideas. Any uh, suggestions on what kind of rewards, recognitions, incentives that you're providing? And this is open to all of you, so anyone can take this question. Okay, so um, I know you have asked too many questions in one uh, this. So the first part is uh, with respect to, you asked in terms of where does one draw the line? In terms of privacy, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that we need to keep in mind as leaders. Oh, yes. I think uh, anything to do with, I think as leaders, I truly believe people will come and confide in us, not just us, for that matter, in anyone, where they know that that information is going to be kept sacrosanct, right? So it could be any kind of information that they share. So in terms of maintaining that privacy, that confidentiality, of course, is very important. Okay. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect of it is in terms of whatever data that is churned up also. Today you have, uh, you know, uh, I think all of us in HR, we have access to very, very sensitive employee information. So making sure that information is closely guarded and, you know, uh, the privacy is maintained at all levels is, of course, I think our, our utmost duty to make sure that, that all the, you know, everything, every single compliance check that needs to be done to preserve that information, both in written or, you know, like I said, you know, even if something which is shared orally needs to be kept. Um, the second part, which you talked about in terms of the reward and recognition programs, I think the reward and recognition programs um, uh, for us here at Datamatic, so we have monthly, okay, we have a monthly r, &R program. We also have an annual one, but an annual one is a gala event, right? It's almost like uh, where we call everybody, the winners are called with one member from their family and so on. But I think what really people look for, gen typically for today's, uh, the, the Gen Z's, is essentially the fact that they are looking at feedback on the job and recognition immediately. Sometimes it could be as simple as just a thank you card or you know, being recognized in front of his or her team members to say this person has done a phenomenal job because then we are reinforcing that those are the kind of behaviors we want to. So in my view, I think what has worked best, okay, I, I mean, we work with people where the average age in our organization is about 26, 27 is where people get feedback regularly on the job. So whether it is, you know, even if it is the best of feedback or even if it's just constructive feedback where he and she needs to improve. Uh, and I think that does work because people see that their managers are invested in them and uh, making sure that uh, people know about it, right? So whether it is announcements in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the newsletters that companies may have and so on and so forth. So I think anything which is, it's about saying, you know, you need to do it at the right time. Just like justice uh, denied is, uh, justice delayed is justice denied. Similarly, recognition delayed is in a way recognition denied. So, uh, so that's my take on it. Anybody else? Does anybody want to add anything around that? I think uh, just to add to what Lolly said, uh, from a privacy standpoint, it's absolutely critical. And UK organization where GDPR is quite heavy, heavily regulated, it becomes even more difficult. Just to give you an example, we are hybrid, but we were not even able to track line by line data of people who come into work and not come into work. And there's an ongoing conversation in terms of how do we protect the privacy, even to that level of data. When it comes to well-being, absolutely, it's the factor of trust that we need to be imbibing and embedding in terms of anything, especially when it comes to mental mental health and emotional health, when our partners come into, our EAP partners come into uh, effect. I think it's about the confidence and the trust that the colleagues will have to own, even within internally, whether it's HR or whether it's my team who actually manages grievances, et cetera, and all of that. How tightly do we manage? It's overly regulated. And within the boundaries of what can and what we can't do is is what the beauty lies in terms of you know, striking the right balance. 
recognition. Um, uh, you know, what Lolly talked about is quite common in terms of what we all do. Absolutely agree what, whatever we say. Within Atlas, we call it love. Give your love, which is living your values. So we call it LOV. And it's quite instant. And we use a platform uh, which is quite instant. And when, when somebody recognizes me, my manager gets copied. And it's quite instant, like, thank you. We have monthly, we have quarterly, we have half yearly, just to ensure that colleagues are recognized and the right, the right level of monetary benefits follows through. It's just not about the monetary, because again, like how well-being is different for individuals, recognition is different for individuals. I don't, I'm not carried away with cash or monetary benefits or vouchers, but I would like to be recognized with more work, or more visibility, and stuff like that. So how do we actually evolve to become much more customizable in terms of, you know, what works for me may not work for the others. But I think our managers do a brilliant job. I must say, I think we have a lot of responsibilities that we expect of our managers. And in the context of well-being, managers are not doctors, are not experts, but how do we sensitize them? How, do, how can they actually detect early signs um, and give them the right direction in terms of where to go for help is, has become an important uh, uh, important aspects, Diksha. Come to that sensitization part. That's one question that I want to ask all of you because it's extremely important. But uh, you've all talked about various programs, right? So now, uh, can you give some examples of programs that you have implemented? Uh, one that are sort of popular? Are there certain themes that are more popular than others when it comes to this? And I want to cover all aspects. So whether it is physical, mental, psychological, we spoke about financials, all of you, almost all of you mentioned financials, right? So maybe some inputs on what are you guys doing there? And also an idea about what worked and what did not work in terms of approach, right? And uh, also what kind of programs are popular? Some examples, best practices, if each and uh, Sachin, if I could start with you on that. You're on mute. Yeah, so in the interest of time, I'll give you one or two things that are that we did. You know, uh, uh, why Arvind talked about it, the financial well being specifically for women, how important it is. That's exactly one of the programs that has the highest participation and the highest. Uh, positive feedback. Uh, it was a specially program created by our CFO for our uh, women members, right from the senior members in the organization to everyone in the honor team, which is our women team. And you know, right from the overall structure, how to go about tax saving to go into creating, uh, you know, structure, taking, creating a template, using them. What are the different nuances? What generally, you know. When you're doing a financial well-being session, there's some of the other interest from the vendor or a partner who has as when it is coming from a CFO, the trust of the team anyway goes up multifold because you're talking about an expert coming in as one of the leaders. So I think that one was a super success in terms of participation, right? And a value. Well, there's another program which where the participation is less, but we all have been talking about is around our emotional uh, well-being, our mental well-being, how to put it. And we have this program called Mitra, right? Uh, um, so this is an element of an internal um, champions as well as the external partners, which is our EAP partner. So there's a set of individuals and it is led by our happiness evangelist. We have two full-time roles like in happiness evangelist, there's a full-time role like a listening champion whose role is only to be there when people need someone, right? They're about talking to people uh, uh, during gr any grief at home, family, during tough times, physically, you know, mentally, personal life, uh, at office, stress, manager, some fights, some dialogues, discussion, disagreements. So this team, which is kind of Mitra team along with an extended sort of people, are our first level of um, connect with people. They, people know that if I have anything, it is a neutral team first. It is not a BU team. It does not report to BU, neither as a business partnering. It does not have any other role other than being for them for this firm. So let's suddenly build the credibility of those people and the neutrality that comes in. And we talked about you know privacy information. This information, they don't even share with me. 
you know they will only come when there is a something which requires an attention right and uh, i think that's comes out very beautifully it reaches out to people when people need them there's also an element which is like you know how to probably manage it a little early so there's a platform called hapometer where you know people say i'm happy not happy you know today just like a lighter uh, saying if my my satisfaction level again the reason could be any and within four hours of you reaching out no bot reaches out but an individual from the team reaches out to you you know how can i help if suddenly you find it you know uh, there are things you are able to attend quite early in stage those dialogue listening people venting it out or they getting a direction hey do you i think you want to connect with our eap partners they set the connection and they get the people if they think are serious you know if people who can just wanted a listening and say ah, i'm feeling better i will go back to their home a little lighter you know i we have seen such a success story we call it like uh happiness memoir which is a series of communication of how people you know send a gratitude note hey thanks for being there listening to me for 30 minutes now i'm feeling much better kind of stuff you know those kind of things go a very very long way in terms of impacting people's well-being and probably touching them before things get serious or things get out of hand and when things get a difficult you have your subject matter experts and the eap even these people are certified counselors but we'll always have a dedicated team who would do uh rest of the room many more but these two examples we felt that might be relevant for us fair and a very good example sachin thank you for that uh, tendra do you have anything yes i think uh, we do have quite a bit but let me actually restrict it to two three uh, that i quickly want to touch upon one is uh, from a new program or a new initiative or whatever you want to call it out i think uh, we saw increased requ- request from a mental health emotional health coming from some of our colleagues and therefore early this year you know we introduced something called as a safe leave which is really focusing on colleagues uh, providing them opportunities when in in the context of domestic abuse um definitely very confidential in terms of we don't track them but i think it's a it's a it's a paid time off that is provided to colleagues when they need in terms of you know if they need to go and attend to certain certain aspects of it that's definitely landed well for colleagues because they do have a provision rather than worrying about oh, i don't have time for this because the number of times that i will have to invest um you know in in terms of health side etc and all of that was was really high so that's really landed well for us the second aspect that i want to talk to you about is social wellbeing uh, i think uh, in the past like pre covid land i'm talking about eras before we used to have this family day etc and office this year i think after so so many years about getting the family together from a social wellbeing standpoint was a very very big hit for us uh, we had lots of families come together making making the bond etc and all of that so we continue to invest into those gatherings and getting the community you know from from a family standpoint getting into whether in office or outside offices at work for us um and happy or you know happy children happy your parents has been an initiative when we did a kids carnival and i think it was during the holiday season for the kids etc that seemed really really high in take from the kids as well as the parents i mean i would restricted it to only for our kids but it was just extended to anybody who's interested so that really saw a very very high in take uh, diksha so i think one must be doing christmas now that christmas is around the corner <laughs> Yeah, already we are in Christmas. Thanksgiving just got over, so Christmas is already up there. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Yeah. So, Arvind, yes. Anything that you want to add? Uh... Yeah, I think I, I think uh, we've covered most of it. But some something unique uh, we do is you know uh, more on the social side because the physical, mental part mm-hmm. I think is fairly well standardized. But I think what I saw really extremely interesting is we have something called gratitude as attitude. that's been a practice that's been there for a long time so there are two parts to it there's one month we celebrate where anybody can send a thank you note to anybody who starts their lives in the organization that's a, and that really you know works pretty well uh, and the second part is you know uh, at any point of the year in your payroll you can actually contribute to you know as part of gratitude to attitude right and we have a lot of uh, you know uh, we do a lot of work on the csr space we have mastic foundation where we do you know uh, you know incredible work with the not so privileged society be it in the space of healthcare education etc so i i believe you know that really connects people a lot to the organization and you know the what they do 
because uh, the sense of purpose you derive in these things are you know uh, you know is something you can't really you know measure or value but people really connect to these things as an organization right so that's something i really found it you know a phenomenal way to connect people to a larger purpose right because when for example the pandemic happened everybody came together as a you know a society right you nobody really thought okay who's my neighbor what's his background where he comes from so i think the gratitude you know uh, you know initiative what i talked about is you know one of the initiatives that is well uh, well recognized uh, in the company and we do something called as dhan utsav you know that's something we do during the you know the week the week of giving is when we do it where uh, again it's fairly uh, you know linked to what i said earlier uh, people contribute a lot in terms of both monetary and also their time to ensure that we are participating in a lot of social initiatives so so that's something we do fairly well and it's been a one of the very good practices i've seen that has been that everybody is proud about when you talk to a master here you know they talk a lot about it and they're associated a lot with it and i think that gives a lot of you know some kind of peace i would say or a well being to what they do and i liked uh, tendal's point which i think we do a lot i think we involve families a lot you know because it's it, being a little you know fairly old company i think some of the practices we do have a lot of value right you know if you look at good old days at tatas or you know all the historic companies family is very integral to the uh, you know employee right so we do a lot of events like for example uh, i mean i was amazed i mean this is my second week of my joining i went to ahmedabad that's where we are one of the biggest bases so the um, that's when you have the navratra right that's when the garba dance happens i mean i've never seen i worked in big companies you know different places but i never seen an event where you had uh, you know five to 600 employees their and then their spouses you can imagine the size they're talking about 1000 lot people and it's a full evening program because garba happens from you know 6:30 to 7 goes on to 2:00 in the morning and people look forward to it right i mean actually you know we don't have to follow up and ask them to come for the event so it's uh, so i think that way the family connect what tendal talked i think we do it very well here and uh, especially some of the employees who were very tenured of you know very you know fondly and passionately you know remember it uh, now that the size is large and you're remote some of these things are challenging but i think getting your family connected to the organization you know obviously we don't we are obviously keep the personal and professional side out but it's important that they understand because the reality is you know most of your waking up hours assuming we sleep for 6 to 7 hours and do a rest couple of hours you are with your work colleagues right you are actually on a laptop or your phone so when your family connects to what you do i think there is a lot of you know uh, i mean a well being is what i think people see it right there is a lot of social well being that happens in the process so that's something i really you know uh, allude to you know in terms of getting your family get a connect to what you pursue you know in your professional life so like from your side anything also from a financial perspective is there something that you're doing yeah so so both the aspects so i'll probably just talk about one program which we launched if i let me talk about two so one is the coaching initiative right we launched within the organization about a year and a half back and we actually got such amazing response we were actually able to track performance of people who were probably struggling and due to many issues right some but sometimes many a times performance is not got anything to do with whether the individual knows it could be something else which is weighing him down him or her down so i think the coaching uh, initiative worked wonderfully another initiative which we did last year actually this is not something which datamatics initiated we took part in an uh, initiative which was run by people matters uh, skill soft and akshay patra as a combined it was more of a csr initiative where skill soft had opened up its library okay and there were a group of about Uh, i think 32 or participating companies many many large entities both across it fmcg and so on and when we participated uh, i think our whole objective was to see because this had a very noble initiative right the noble intention was such that um, for every course you complete one hungry child gets a meal for every 100 hours that you complete okay of courses done there's one underprivileged kids education for the whole year which is sponsored so we reached out to people i mean we all know that historically to get you know no matter the best of lmss and all that you have people doing self learning at their own this the, the the success rates are relatively much lower now this was for us a case study in itself where we said that you know what let's reach out to people so we had a campaign of sorts we reached out to every single individual within the organization uh, uh, physically who are there working in office and to, for the rest remotely 
the beauty of this is this was open for a span of about 45 days. Okay. We had, we ranked at number one. We covered the maximum number of uh, courses and the maximum number of this. Despite I know that our uh, headcount, we were we are about barely 1500 people. And we are competing with companies who are having like 20 or 30,000. The only thing which I think really worked and with a participation uh, extent of almost 78% of people participate, right? Because here was a direct correlation of, you know, we said it can't be a better win-win situation. You have nothing to lose. You're learning something. And for everything that you learn, there is a hungry uh, child who gets a meal, right? Similarly, so this, in a way, if I would say the emotional appeal worked and this was a perfect example of making it a win-win-win situation for all stakeholders involved. So, so I think many a times, I think when programs are launched um, uh, and it's key that, you know, it's followed through to really see that you get the end result. So I think, yeah, these were two things which I wanted to share. Thank you. For me, the key takeaway here is that the social angle plays a very, very, very important role in well-being. Not just the program, but individuals feeling valued. Right, that makes yeah. a Sorry, of... and I know Diksha, you asked me one question around the finance aspect, which I think I missed responding. So I'll just quickly respond sure. to that. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, the personal finance, let me talk about it. And I know both Arvind and Sachin have covered it. But I think this is definitely an area. And this is not just about uh, male or female. I think many a times, both genders, they may be sometimes... Uh, needing a lot of help in this area. So this is one aspect where we actually conduct masterclasses within our organization at least once a quarter. And trust me, it's gotten phenomenal response. We have people come back and say, oh, I never knew that, you know, taking a term life insurance is so important, right? So MediClaim, chalo, the company has already got a cover. While the company also has a term life cover, but, you know, I never knew that, you know, I need to have this. Or I never knew that these are multiple avenues of investment and I can't just put all my eggs in one basket. So this kind of personal finance, how do you take care of your money? Right. And, and so relevant for youngsters, but many a times, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of the Western culture where it talks about, you know, you live for the day kind of a thing is slowly also seeping into India. So it's important for people to be more and more aware of how do you really hear this? And I think some of these programs from a financial well-being aspect, definitely goes a long way in sort of making people feel more uh, okay. reassured that there are ways, you know, to save and uh, make, you know, sort of, you can start wealth creation right from the first year of your uh, uh, career. Yeah, start early, basically, as early as possible. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, all of you talked about, you know, one of the key points for success of these programs is getting the buying from probably the CEO to everybody, to the first line manager, right? And that come, that brings me to my next question, which is on sensitization. Uh, I know we are running out of time. So if you can very, very short, uh, give us an idea of what sensitization programs you run or, or just one key thing that will make a difference in making sure that such programs are successful. Uh, Lolly, you can start. I think for any program to be successful, the buy-in right from top is very crucial, right? Uh, which means that the minute there is a buy-in from all the leaders, then automatically that information cascades down. And the minute you have that buy-in and that sensitization of how this will help. So what I just shared about learn for a cause initiative, right? The minute we first sold it to the leaders that, you know, this is what we plan to do. So please nudge your team members to do this whenever they have free time. Uh, and people actually use most of their weekends. It was over a 45-day period and you had leaders nudging them. We created leader boards. Which leader is doing better? How he or she is nudging? And it was a sure shot winner. So I think getting buy-in, sensitizing them, helping them see what is in it for them is, in my view, whatever I've seen through over the years is always a winner of sorts. Sachin, what about you? Uh, anything that you do different or special to get uh, you're on mute, Sachin. Yeah, first, I think um, it comes from the top, you know, given Ashok as a founder of the organization, the name, the vision, the leadership, it has come very, very naturally to us that it comes from the top. Just like few practices that we have, like, you know, uh, as, you know, uh, Arvind was talking about, 
any meeting that starts in the organization starts with a note of gratitude. It's something that has now built in the culture uh, and practice in the organization. And I think that's how it's all start. And when you talk about well-being and we wanted to create that awareness, it was quite obvious for us that leadership take the first step. You know, when you talk about mental well-being, if I can't bring my leadership talking about it, you know, I, I have been having issues, you know. I have, you have to be vulnerable. You have to tell, you know, it's not uh, you, it's everyone, people at different stages, different time. And, you know, it's not that you may not feel stress. It's about how you come out of that, how you come out of your IT. And I think we did some leadership uh, chats, conversations, roundtables, or, you know, panels within our team. Let them talk about uh, their own personal experience of mental well-being. I think once that happened, it was people started talking about it. Leave alone. We are not even talking about really using the facility that is available. In fact, the last few months, we are seeing there is an uptake again in terms of our EAP services utilization. But I think it's more about people living. Our leaders need to be vulnerable. They are talking about, you know, we have, our, we also face certain challenges. We overcome that. Uh, our team members do that. So maybe, maybe for you as well, look at it. You know, I have gone through and given my assessment about my stress level. Have you given that? Have you completed your HRA or have you completed your assessment? Have you checked on yourself? Have you talked to, have you clicked on the hypometer about how you're feeling today? I think those conversations are coming for leader and genuine conversation, not okay, uh, HRA send a mail, let me send it, you know, leading, getting into dialogue in their conversations and making it happen. That really goes well, coming from the top, coming from the culture, coming from something we strongly believe in. So visi uh, visible leadership. Absolutely. Visible That's leadership, right. vulnerable leadership. Right, visible and vulnerable. Yeah. I think we're out of time, so I'm going to quickly ask the last question. And this is like, uh, you can think of it as a rapid fire question to all of you. Um, in the short term, right? Maybe next one year, one and a half years. Uh, two key priority areas uh, and two key challenges that you intend to address. Uh, we can go with, uh, again, uh, Tendril. Uh, you can go first, please. I think for us, it's going to be sustaining what we're doing. It's about consistency. And that's going to be a challenge in terms of keeping the required expectations of your colleagues, right? I think it's about how can we be customizable and sustaining what you already started. Be good at it. Uh, that's, that's going to be a number one priority for us and the challenge for us to sustain it. Where we would like to dial up is definitely on the two elements of mental well-being as well as financial well-being. As much as we, we are doing a quite a bit in these areas, what we hear back from our colleagues is they need more help there um, because it's not a straightforward black and white out there, whereas you know others, you can still be able to get an impact. Out here, it's going to be really, really dicey for us. We have a very solid way of measuring um, Diksha, and therefore, we listen to people, and therefore, people want a lot more financial support from our financial well-being. We spoke a lot, but it's a very thin area, so that's going to be the focus for us. Sachin, for you? Yeah, I think building on what you said, on the mental well-being, we're still not able to break the barrier, you know, that the people, the 45% of the people need one or the other way of support in terms of anxiety, stress, or anything. I think that is not opening. That barrier we are not able to um, mm -hmm. break, and I think that's one continuous conversations and area. Once that happens, the adaption will happen. And I think the second area is, you know, lifestyle related diseases. We're feeling that even our insurance coverages, claims, and we're seeing, I think the lifestyle uh, used uh, diseases and challenges are increasing significantly, which is directly impacting the productivity, well-being, long life. You know, uh, Arvind said, you need not to be old to die. So I think that's where one, one focus, which is on ground immediate impact, and second is where we need to break the barrier before we start making it. Right. Good. Thank you, Sachin. Lolly? I think in, uh, in terms of uh, challenges, I would say it would mean to sustain these levels of, so if you've got employee engagement levels in the range of 90 or 92, the way I see it is our upcoming challenges is going to be to see how we can sustain it, how can we get more and more people to be aligned to, you know, seeing that they are taking care of themselves and therefore, they are becoming, you know, more productive members within the organization. I think that's largely what I would say would be the key challenge. Yeah, so each per, each employee becoming a wellness champion in themselves, probably. In a that way, yes. 
for himself yeah. and for his colleagues. But and how do you hold that safe, safe space for everyone else? Yeah. Right. So as a leader, as Sachin rightly talked about, as leaders, when you're sh- willing to show that you're vulnerable, you give others the safe space to also become vulnerable and, you know, sh- uh, showcase their vulnerabilities. Thank you, uh, Dali and Advin. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just to add, uh, I think the challenge I foresee is how do we empower and, you know, uh, enable our managers in the second la- layer to be as adept as the leaders? Because I think by and large, if you hear, most of the leadership is committed to it. Right? I mean, wellness is no more good thing to do, right? It's a must thing to have. have. So, but the challenge would be how do you translate that to the next two, three, four levels and everybody becomes a champion. So only then you can sustain and, you know, kind of, you know, make the program spread across. So that I think is a challenge. And the second is what Sachin said, right? Of the physical or lifestyle related aspects, you know, because of the way we're working, the way we're spending time on the computer. I think people have to get, like how you have, you know, some time, your time, my time, there should be some physical activity time so that, you know, people are, you know, able to get over these things. Uh, and hopefully that will make them better, you know, fitter people to be more productive and have happier lives. That's what I would do. So thank you so much. A um, lot of learnings for me as well. Um, and a lot of points that you mentioned, probably I'll take it up for more detailed discussion. And hopefully that will help, you know, employees as well. But uh, I think we're out of time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lolly, Tendril, Arvind, and Sachin for taking your time off. And thank you, audience. As I mentioned, a recording of this uh, webinar will be available on demand on our uh, YouTube channel. And I'll share the link with all of you. Have a great Thanks, weekend. Sir. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye.